Jessica, welcome to Infinite Games. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. So I am thrilled uh, to, to, to sit down and talk with you for a bunch of reasons. But, you know, this episode, we're really going to explore PR around not only your background, but obviously the firm that you founded, Bevel. And the reason there is because I feel like I don't understand PR very well, and I'm guessing I'm not alone. And so I've worked at companies where PR has played a massive role uh, in making the company successful. You know, I think Square is a great example there. Um, and yet I don't really understand the tactics. I don't really understand how it works. And so the goal is to sit down with you and try to... I don't know, get a, get as much downloaded from your brain as possible. <laughs> All about PR. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so what I wanted to start is just at a super basic level, if you could define PR and talk about the role PR plays in building brands and companies over time. So my definition of PR is the ability to build brands and influence different stakeholders. So more traditionally, people always thought about it just as media relations, but it's really your skill to communicate somebody's story to anyone. Uh, and that can be your stakeholders, that can be investors, that can be employees, both internal and new prospective employees, and then, of course, the media. But I sort of think of the media as the last thing when I think mm. about PR. So it's much more, you know, kind of starting internally and then working out. Is that the right idea? Starting internally, figuring out what is our product? What is, you know, what messages do we want to communicate externally? Who do we want to communicate to? And sometimes that makes sense doing it with the media and sometimes it doesn't. I think a, a good example is my husband says, I'm very good at PR. I never... <laughs> I never lose any argument, but oftentimes I never get into arguments because I'm always pivoting and switching the topic, which can be very frustrating yeah. to be married to me. You take your I media can... relation skills. <laughs> to very <your> seriously. <laughs> <laughs> which is probably helpful and probably not so helpful at the same time. <laughs> right. Exactly. I... um. I want to kind of clarify terms as well, too. So PR obviously stands for public relations. I've also heard it referred to as strategic communications. Do you have a favorite word? Have you just kind of accepted PR because it's well known? We haven't accepted PR, and I'll tell you why. I hate the term PR girl or, mm. hey, you're the PR. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but people no. tend to say it. They say, oh, hey, it's the PR it's sort of strange, you know, you would never call a doctor like doctor girl or yeah. whatever. Yeah. So anyways, at least at Bevel, so we are a strategic communications firm and we are structured much more in a way similar to a Bain or McKinsey and think of our th ourselves as strategic advisors versus, you know, straight public relations. Yeah, 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 yeah. That makes sense. When you think about incredible PR, um, and I'm really excited to hear your answer on this, what handfuls of companies come to mind and what do you like about their approach? And, you know, part of that is I think everybody has an opinion on what ads they like. I think it's very different. You know, how do you like how companies show up in the world? So I'm curious what it would be your top list or, you know, two to three companies you think are interesting in terms of how they approach it. Wow. I think all the companies that I work on, obviously, uh, you know, my favorite kind of PR is the ability to really change and shift a narrative. So in my career, when I worked at Moody's, it was just coming out of the subprime mortgage crisis, and they were largely blamed, you know, for mm -hmm. causing it. And so the goal and the mission was, how do we learn from what happened and how do we shift the brand and take accountability and then talk about what we're doing differently? And so that was an interesting exercise. Um, and then for Moody's, I went to Point 72, and that's Steve Cohen's family office. A lot of people know him for the show Billions, which is loosely based on the firm. But when SAC Capital was shut down for insider trading, and then Steve, you know, he's one of the most resilient people that I've ever met, kept going and reopened, it was critical to rebuild the brand and talk about what we were doing differently and how we could attract top talent. And I remember when I made the decision to join Point 72, a lot of people were like, 
what are you doing? You know, you have so many opportunities at Moody's. This doesn't really make sense. Why would you, why would a hedge fund manager need PR? And everyone needs PR. I think anyone who is leading any category can really benefit from reputation management. And it's not something that comes to everyone easily, nor should it, unless you're, you know, a sociopath and you just like talking about yourself. Yeah. That's true. It's not, it's not, it's one of the, it falls into the bucket of skills that we should all probably be taught a little bit of, but we inevitably we're taught nothing. <laughs> we just have to figure right. it out on our own. <laughs> exactly. Talk a little bit more about um, Point 0.72 and Stephen Cohen. And, you know, as we discussed, I think everyone listening to this podcast will definitely know who Stephen Cohen is and I think have interest. So I'm curious just if you could share your perspective on what was it like to be a part of the firm and what was it like to work with him? It was really exciting. I think the opportunity to join was a highlight of my career. And it was, or is arguably, one of the most well-known stories in finance. And so to be in the room and to be the person who was deciding on strategy, which reporters we were speaking with, which conferences we were speaking at, and the baseline was always no. (laughs) We're not speaking with anyone, which, is a strategy in and of itself. Everybody wants to know what they don't have access to, right? And so we were extremely strategic about who we would speak to and when we would speak to them. I would say working with Steve as a spokesperson and a thought leader, uh, he was one of the smartest people I've ever worked for, mostly because he would ask the question that would cut through every other question so you wouldn't have to be in the meeting for an hour. Like he would take a meeting that was supposed to last 90 minutes and just cut to the core of it within five minutes. So I thought that was fascinating to watch. And, um, you know, he really is an introverted person. He loves to trade and he loves his family and that's all he wanted to do. Uh, So he would carve out time to focus on PR, which was not something that came to him naturally. He didn't like to speak in front of a lot of people. We did a lot of work on, you know, what words are you going to say? When are you going to say them? And why are you going to say them? Hmm. And it was mostly spent on Sundays at 7.30 a.m. Uh, in his Picasso room. So I didn't really have a life, to be honest, on the weekends because I would have to get up really early to drive there on Sundays. But it was definitely worth it. When you work with someone like that who's, you know, a public figure, but they're very introverted, did you have to do any explaining about why PR was important? Or did he already under, you know, kind of understand that? He understood the importance, but there are a lot of executives who their first response is always no. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I think as a strategic communicator coming to the table with the opportunity in my mind is only 25%. The rest is convincing the executive team why this matters and why Mm. they should even spend their time. Uh, And then really, really manufacturing and managing the opportunity. So I like to say that an interview is not a space for new thoughts. You know, it's an ad. Uh, usually, or it's an opportunity to talk to an audience that you haven't communicated to. Mm -hmm. So you should never go into an interview and sort of just speak off the cusp, right? That doesn't make a lot of sense. But you will find uh, CEOs are busy, and they don't take the time to prep, you'll send, you know, them the prep document. So I think one of the most important things is to really understand your executive and how to best communicate with them, whether that's via slack or text or a call or mm-hmm. emails or whatever it's super interesting I, I, that um percentage is kind of staggering that you know you the, uh, the opportunity is only 25 25 <laughs> percent of it and the rest 75 percent is literally working on it managing it um i think that says a lot obviously about the importance of prep <laughs> and the after piece of it too so when you're junior and you get into pr you get really excited if you get an opportunity and then you tend to get disappointed if your spokesperson turns it down. Usually they turn it down because you didn't give them reasons why it's important um, and you didn't come to the table like ready with mm-hmm. that, that information. 
And then the rest of it is actually managing the interview, doing the follow-up, figuring out what's interesting. How do you build out the story? How do you bring other resources and sources to the table? And that's something that I think differentiates Bevel from a lot of other communications firms. Yeah. It's like landing the opportunities a small part <laughs> and then begins Very the real small. work. <laughs> right. Exactly. Uh, so you, you know, you have this experience at Point72. Then you moved to Acorns where you joined as chief communications officer. And part of that is, you know, Bevel has a really interesting model, which we can talk about now, of kind of embedding within the firm. But talk about what attracted you to Acorns and, you know, what it's been like, because that's something now you've done for years. And this is a brand that, you know, I think has has built up um, an enormous amount of goodwill. I feel like almost everybody recognizes and knows the names Acorn knows the name Acorns. So what is it like, you know, what attracted you there? And then what has it been like to kind of work with that team over time? And, and see this come to life? Sure. So Steve Cohen started a venture capital fund, Point72 Ventures, and I worked on the launch of the fund and started working with all of the different portfolio companies when we would make an investment. And one of the first ones was Acorns. And I just absolutely fell in love with the brand and the mission of the company, which is to empower everyday investors to start saving and investing. Mm -hmm. It was very different from anything I had done. I'd always worked in financial services, sort of, you know, making money for people who already had a lot of money versus giving back. And so the CEO, Noah Kerner, he was just like, what you did in three days, no one has done in three years. And what he meant was just the velocity of the coverage, but also how on message it was mm -hmm. at the time, or I think it's still true today. But one, there aren't a lot of people who go into financial communications. Most people who go into PR are like, I want to do beauty or fashion or consumer or, you know, entertainment, something a little bit more sexier. Most people are not like, oh, <laughs> I want to do fintech. That's just not a common thing no. you hear out of people majoring in PR. So there was definitely a need for it. And then I worked on another uh, funding announcement and that CEO was like, oh, I want you to come and work for me. And then Steve was like, well, you're not going anywhere. So I ended up having three people who all wanted me to handle their communications. And so I thought, why don't I start Bevel? Um, and at the same time, you know, really join Acorn as a partner. Um, and more recently, I joined as their chief communications officer because uh, they were considering going public and I wanted to be the one to take them into the public markets. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that, because I know um, you, you know, you work with a number of companies, obviously leading up to IPOs. Now, obviously, a very common route, uh, you know, through a SPAC, uh, which is in some way similar but different. You have to get shareholder support. People have to basically vote and say, yes, you know, that they do want this company to come public. Um, and all of that's fascinating because these companies typically have been private for five, 10 years. But, you know, I think somewhere in that in the five to 10 year range is pretty typical. Mm -hmm. um, and now they're getting ready to go public. And I know that you work with them, you know, kind of on the, I don't know, the uh, airstrip, in the 12 months before they take <laughs> off. What are you doing? And why is that period so important? Sure. So a lot of companies come to us when they're either considering any sort of liquidity event, whether they're going to be acquired or they're going to go public via SPAC or the traditional route. And Bevel is one of the few firms that works with a company from seed all the way into liquidity. Hmm. In that 12 months period, it's critical that you're really building out the profile of the executive team. I think in the beginning stages of a private company, most founders or CEOs tend to focus on product and customers and not as much of building their external profile. Hmm. It's very important that investors know who's helming the ship and building out that executive bench so that it's not just this typical like founder profile, but it's a real company. Mm -hmm. And then figuring out like those 12 months leading up, what announcements do we have? How can we figure out key growth metrics that we can communicate to investors? Which ones make sense? Which ones don't make sense? Uh, and you better make sure you have them right or else, you know, compliance and 
the SEC will come knocking on your door. So we figure out what does this roadmap look like? How can we, from this point moving forward, try to grow the valuation from, you know, a billion dollars to $2 billion to $3 billion? And a lot of that comes from the public market and the image and the perception. And I think you've seen a lot of companies who haven't done it well. If you look at, you know, the WeWork example, which is everybody knows, but it's fairly tragic. I don't think that they managed, uh, well, I don't think Adam Newman really managed that well from a public relations point of view anyway. No, it's a great example because I feel like, you know, everyone, when you say we work, I think everybody thinks of obviously all the drama around Adam Newman. And yet, you know, I find what they've built amazing. Like I love being in WeWork locations. They're beautiful. They're, they're really nice. You know, so it is a great example. Why? It, but it, it is a little bit counterintuitive to think that, OK, I'm getting ready to go public. Obviously, we need to focus on the company. We also need to focus on the exec. What? um I guess, like, what do's and don'ts? Like, what, what kind of tactics are you using when you're working with execs? Is it figuring out their personal brand? Is it figuring out, you know, whether they should tweet or post and how much? Because <laughs> I feel like now there's also a lot of CEOs that have, you know, almost celebrity status just under their own brand name. I'll talk a little bit about that. Sure. Well, I think, well, one, so we're launching a completely separate practice uh, in early March focused on, building executive profiles and, you know, just like personality branding, which is a little bit different work than marketing communication. So it's more of a publicist role. And my view is as a CEO, the way you're leading your company and your actual day-to-day responsibilities should change. So Mm -hmm. you should be focused on communicating with investors, communicating with the media, everything should be external. And then you should have a really strong president or COO who's running the day-to-day operation. And what we focus on is what conferences make the most sense? How do we build custom events so that we're communicating to investors or customers? Um, Having a really strong internal communications program so that you're leading the organization through this change and they know everything that's going on. And they're very excited about it and hopefully working harder, which in this era of the great resignation is even more important than it ever has been. Um, And then awards and all those sorts of things, but making sure there's a very consistent and steady drumbeat. And I love to really understand who these people are as individuals. Mm -hmm. What makes you a crazy person that would decide to start a company? It's not exactly or, you know, the path that most people take. And so we try to figure out, you know, what was your childhood like? How were you raised? What influenced you? Why are you doing what you're doing? And then putting some like human element into who they are to help communicate their story. One of the things you touched on there was consistency, you know, which makes me think of one, um, you know, when I think about the execs, that have been the most impressive that I've worked with, you know, one just in and of themselves, they're very consistent. And I think a big part of that's, that's important for building trust. That's important for always showing up as the same person, but it's also very subtle in that, you know, I think a lot of people don't necessarily think, Oh, if I'm more consistent, if, you know, if I show up in a more consistent way day to day, it's going to build trust. What, just talk a little bit about the importance of consistency and why that's so important in like shaping perception or managing perception or keeping it positive. Sure. Well, speaking of consistency, I mean, Steve wore the same sweater every single day. (laughs) Not the same one. I'm assuming he had all different sweaters that he would dry clean. But, um, you know, it's sort of an expected thing. It does help to build trust. But in terms of what you're communicating externally, I think it's important to figure out three key themes or narratives that you're always touching upon that align back to your values, but also to the brand. Um, And then any opportunity there is to be talking about those in the market, you should be taking that. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, I think the numbers, whether you hit them or not, they should always be the same numbers and they should be consistent to the brand. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's what the market always reports on. I'll give you an example. When we first started building Acorn's brand. Every single reporter wanted to talk about AUM. 
-hmm. And for Acorns, it wasn't about AUM. It was really about how do we help every single American who's making under 100000 a year start saving and investing. It's very difficult when you're investing with spare change to amass a high AUM, right? And like most financial institutions, the way they make money is by making money off of people mm -hmm. who have already amassed their wealth. So we really had to flip the narrative and the script and tell reporters that's not important. Like We're not even focused on that number. I know you're focused on that number, but here's what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. I, I want to talk for a second about, you know, these um, some of the big moments that will happen, um, you know, when you're kind of it, it, big moments that are happening that will happen when you're trying to obviously get a company coverage. And so you talked about having these three themes, having this steady drumbeat of obviously, um, you know, updates or news stories or data points or releases, interviews around those things. But there's also the like single appearance that can have a dramatic effect. And I know we were talking before that Acorns um, had a segment on the Today Show, which resulted in what, 100,000 plus downloads within an hour, it, which is incredible. So talk a little bit about those, why they're important, and maybe just how much work goes into one of those really big moments of public exposure. Sure. So I think a lot of CEOs, when they first start working with a PR firm, they want a lot. They just want like a ton of stuff to be happening. You know, they always want to see opportunities and that. Uh, I would argue you should really be working toward the high impact and high value opportunities. The one you mentioned when we had Acorns on the Today Show was a big product placement. And within minutes, it wasn't even an hour, within minutes, we had wow. over 120,000 downloads. That's just crazy, you know? And so opportunities like that are really important. I have an, another example. We just launched uh, this travel company where you can search based on price versus where you want to go. It's called Elude. And within the first like week of us launching them, they had... 20,000 signups, mm -hmm. um, 10,000 Instagram followers, and then they closed their next round of funding in three months. And it was like after they went on Fox Business, which a lot of people think like, oh, Fox, you know, not everybody wants to go on Fox if it doesn't align with their political views. I encourage everyone to go on Fox uh, mm -hmm. because they had investors reaching out to them nonstop and their round was oversubscribed. And so that was really important for them. And when they initially approached us, they didn't even have a product. You know, it was really just an idea. <laughs> a lot of people come at that stage. And yes. <laughs> at that stage, sometimes PR makes sense and sometimes it doesn't. It really depends on, is this a product that we've never seen before? And does mm -hmm. it have a need in the market? If that's true, it makes a lot of sense. If mm -hmm. you come to us with a product that doesn't exist, and there's a lot of noise in that specific uh, segment, it's going to be very, very difficult to do PR. Yeah. You talked about, when you were talking about, you know, going after those high impact opportunities, it sounds a lot like investing. You know, it sounds like you're looking for that, you know, asymmetrical outcome where you can land this one show and obviously have a big impact. How does that shape, you know, how your team spends their time? Is it something like 50, 60, 75, even 80% of their times focused on chasing those big opportunities and the rest is the steady dr drumbeat? And I'm curious, just from like a resource allocation, I don't know, time investment standpoint, how you think about right. those things. Well, from a time investment standpoint, we might be operating at a loss, but because it takes a lot of time, oh, yeah. to your point, to develop the right relationship for your client. Uh, one, we already have most of them, but we do like to work in categories where we haven't been before. So hmm. we've always been focused in fintech. I would say we're the top fintech communications firm. But then I'm just a curious person, and so I love working in different industries. And so travel, for example, it, you know, the, the team had to spend a lot of time building relationships with travel and leisure and Condé Nast and all those different publications that would make sense for them. Uh, the way we actually pay our team is different. So it's based on a hedge fund model. Uh, it's performance-based pay where they have set KPIs and – those KPIs are aligned with what our clients are trying to achieve. So number of interviews secured, awards, conferences, um, number of stories, and all, all those sorts of things. And if they hit those, 
they get paid out a quarterly bonus, which is nice for them and nice for us. But that so let's talk a little bit about that because that's one unique aspect of your model another one is this idea of well there's two others that we should talk about one is that you hire people from outside of pr which i think in and of itself is really interesting <laughs> and then the other one is that you have this model where you're not only an external firm that obviously a partner that companies are working with around pr but you're literally embedding your team and yourselves inside that company can you talk about both of those and if i've missed anything else if there's any other kind of fascinating aspects of your model I'd love to just explore that for a little bit. Yeah, so we're a PR firm that doesn't hire PR people. <laughs> to <laughs> Try <start>. telling that <laughs> to a, a recruiting firm. Uh, we actually ended up hiring an internal recruiter. I think it's really important for culture, but we're looking for different kinds of people. So a lot of our team, they come from Goldman or McKinsey. Um, we have people who came from the Shorty Awards and just have different backgrounds in marketing or political affairs, which I think is interesting. And they sort of have a different hustle about them that I really like. But um, at Bevel, I think it's more important that you just you have charisma, you're a native storyteller, you're intellectually curious, and then everything else we can teach you. And so I just like to hire really smart people from outside of communication. What's frustrating about hiring communications people is they tend to have been trained the wrong way. And so then you have to untrain them. And depending on their seniority, it can be a little bit of a mentally defeating process. <laughs> so that's um that's that on embedding our people into the client so i think it's critical and very important that our teams are embedded for a couple of reasons one you need to get the executives in the habit of just constantly communicating to you what's going on what's important to them it really needs to be a collaborative process so if you hire a pr firm and you think like oh, they're just going to come to me with all these amazing ideas when I've told them nothing. That never happens. Mm -hmm. And it really is what you put in is what you get, uh, what, you, what you get out. So as part of our model, we have like for Allude, for example, where they're external head of communications, public.com, same thing. And I think that when you are these like high growth startups, I don't even know if you really need an internal communications person. It tends to be a revolving door and mm -hmm. it's a really hard position to be in at the company because you're trying to build a startup. You don't have any other levers to pull. Whereas at Bevel, we work with very, very high profile investors and VCs and the media always want them on. Mm -hmm. And so then it's like, okay, well, it's tit for tat. Like if I get an opportunity there, then I can slot my client in elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think long-term that makes a lot of sense. And then the third thing that we do and something we'll be expanding on this year, we'll be making a very big announcement, is we actually take equity in our clients and we don't take on any short-term projects. I can't tell you how many companies have come to us like, can you do this funding round? Or, and I just refuse. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't believe in it. I think that building a brand should have sort of a snowball effect where it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so the reason we take equity one is because, you know, the work that we're doing is increasing the valuations of the company. So I think we should get compensated, but also it really helps to align the work that we're doing with the brand. Mm -hmm. It's really unique, and it, I would imagine it takes a lot of courage. Have you ever ha gotten into arguments around, like, well, why don't you hire regular PR people? And, why, you know, they're not good enough. Have you, have you had any of those arguments with other peers, <laughs> other people at other firms? Every single day. <laughs> <laughs> we tried. In the beginning, I tried and tried and tried. I, tr I tried every single recruiter who was known to, you know, hiring communications. And I was just awful. I mean, it was awful. And then when we would have new people come in, oh, well, why don't you just do this? Why don't you just hire from this agency? And I said, well, we're not an agency and we're trying to build something different. And mm -hmm. you can't build something different by hiring the same. Yeah. 
it's a, you talk exactly like a founder, so I'm not, a, a, <laughs> not I'm not surprised <laughs> that you work with a lot of the best founders and companies. I I want to switch for a second and talk about crafting a, a narrative. So you know, I as an investor with a design background. I spend a lot of time working with companies to do very simple stuff, which is try to provide an objective lens on what they're building, why it's interesting, why it's important. And the only reason I say that is because I'm amazed at the number of times where people are like, wow, you know, and it really just takes, I think, another party engaging to help somebody maybe realize their own story. But it, you also just realize that even if you're in it all the time, you don't necessarily know the story. You don't know the right way to frame it up. And so I, I want to get your take on one, like, do you have a process that you follow for crafting a narrative and then just any thoughts? They can be random, they can be all over the map of like, what does it take to craft a narrative and how do you know when you have something that's, that has a spark to it or is working? So it's interesting, even when companies approach us and sometimes they'll have their marketing or their comms person reach out, we never take a client on unless we can speak with the founder and the reason is I really want to understand what is your backstory? What is your narrative? Do you have it? Yeah. Are you going to be somebody who I can put in front of the press? And not everyone is, a, you know, a great spokesperson. I think everyone has their own method to your, you know, something you said earlier was, is it Twitter? Should I be yeah. on Instagram? Should it be podcast? And Every executive has their own thing. There are some people who are awful. I mean, God awful on TV, but they're amazing <laughs> on radio or they're amazing totally. at an internal event or something that's a little bit more controlled where if you stack a fireside chat with their best friend, mm -hmm. you know, like normally they can speak to their best friend. I love to sit down um, with the client and we have a pretty formulaic process in the beginning. We'll have a half day kickoff meeting where we just run through every single question that would really help get us up to speed so that we can speak intelligently on your behalf. But what we're really doing is story mining and figuring out like what is unique to you. I tend to, if something's not interesting, I'll tune off for a while and then you just you know, when somebody says something, you're like, oh, that's it. That's your story. That makes a lot of sense. And then we come back and we'll provide an entire roadmap and just sort of like, how do we keep building on this narrative uh, that's unique to you? And sometimes, you know, the founders will try to change or do something. And I'm like, no, the best <laughs> people. I mean, anyone you think about who has an interesting profile or brand they're always very true to themselves. And I think mm -hmm. that's especially important when you think about crisis communication. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one more question. Then I want to talk about crisis communications because <laughs> I think okay. that's interesting. We can't not talk about that. Do you, uh, you know, one of the things that I always find interesting too is when you're having those conversations with founders about what they're building, you know, sometimes it clicks and you both have the same interpretation or the same idea, but sometimes there's a little bit of back and forth of like, well, this is what I, this is the interesting thing that I think is there. And you're like, well, no, I actually think this is the interesting thing. Do you have that battle and back and forth ever to try to agree or get on the same page around what are the most, what's the right way to frame it and, or what are the most interesting elements of the story? Of course. I mean, there are so many founders who tend to do the same thing and they think everything interesting and it's not there how many vcs have you heard that say like oh we really support our founders and we're there for every, them every vc <laughs> every single vc and so when you say listen we you have to push back and you have to push back confidently and say i've taken a look at over 100 VCs mm -hmm. <laughs> and everyone says that. So that's really not unique. Let's like, yeah. let's go back to the drawing board. Yeah. And they'll sometimes be a little bit taken aback. I don't think that a lot of CEOs are used to people talking totally. to them like that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then we try to get down to like, what is actually unique? What is it that not every single, you know, neo bank and fintech is saying? Mm -hmm. Like democratizing access is not interesting. No. anymore <laughs> yeah no well and that's and that's you know one thing i thought was so interesting about acorns is it it you you know i think part of the success there is like 
you manage to take something that can sound very like wah, wah, wah. Yeah, everybody's doing that and turn it into something that's special and unique and feels really relevant to that brand. I, I want to ask one more question on, on kind of around this. You know, you talked about that any public figure, you know, that people that's well known is very true to themselves. And something I've I've spent a bit of time thinking about and I still don't really know where I land on it is the importance of having a little bit of controversy. And I don't mean that in the negative sense. I mean that in terms of like I, I also think especially now, part of showing up as yourself is in some ways being immovable or being like, no, this is a thing I really care about or being like, I know that this isn't popular, but this is my approach and leaning into that. How much of that do you think about and how much of that do you work with with companies on? And I think what I'm asking there is like, there's the, in some ways you can think, okay, if you have an idea that goes against the grain, then we should definitely lean into that because no, you know, no press is bad or all press is good press. What are your thoughts there on the importance of controversy? We're not, not important. <laughs> I love controversy. <laughs> Reporters are always looking for the opposite or contrarian viewpoint. Mm-hmm. So if you have it and your spokesperson has it, I would say lean into it as much as possible. And that can come in a lot of different forms. You know, if you really want to control the message, I would suggest writing an op-ed for Fortune or TechCrunch or Recode mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, if you're a little bit more comfortable and maybe you're not in a regulated uh, environment, then, you know, you can test the waters a little bit and be controversial. I think the best form of, you know, where you can do that the best is probably on TV. You mm-hmm. should definitely be careful because then it can get cut up and replayed in a lot of different ways. And yep. we've seen that happen. Um, at the beginning of covid we were representing one of the physicians um, who was working with Dr. Fauci. And I mean, he had never done TV in his life. He had zero Instagram followers, zero like any followers, to be honest. Negative we had to like followers. <laughs> negative followers. He showed up to do his first broadcast. It was a dark room. The background was awful. The lighting Ouch. was awful. I think he was, I don't even know where he was looking. So, you know. A lot of work had to go into grooming him. But by the end of it, he was on all the late night shows, the daily shows. Like it was insane. So it's amazing. A little bit of work goes a long ways. Talk a little bit about crisis communication. And, you know, the, the reason I want to bring that up is, you know, at a super high level, it feels like you know, say something very generic. All of us, whether individuals or companies, you know, we're going to go through good times. We're going to go through bad times. And so it feels like a a PR strategy is recognizing that there's good times and bad times. And then being able to help people when they're in a moment, that's not so great. You know, and an example today that I feel like is a company that, um, I don't know, is going through that is definitely Peloton where I'm like, I think they make great products. I think it seems to be a great company. It's obviously in a, in a moment in time, where things are not great <laughs> from a bunch of different angles in terms of how they're perceived. What what do you, I guess, how do you approach that? How do you think about and work with companies when they're in a not so great moment? So first, I just have to say, I'm obsessed with what's going on with Peloton right now <laughs> because it's such a classic, dumb PR case where probably some junior internal employee basically and just like that, reached out to them. They said, hey, we really want to feature Peloton, blah, Mm. blah, blah. And the junior employee probably said, oh, my God, I have this great opportunity to be on the show. And they're all excited. And then they forgot that that was only 25% of the job. 75% of the job is what episode? Who's going to be riding the bike? What's going to happen? Mm -hmm. You know, like, and clearly none of that. There was no dialogue on any of that. And the show actually reached out to us to use our office for one of the episodes. So I, you know, I know how these things work. And with Billion, there was a lot of back and forth, as I'm sure you can imagine, with the producer when I was working for Steve. And so, one, not every opportunity is a good opportunity. Mm-hmm. And I tell every single person who's ever worked for me in communications, and especially at Bubble, when you get on the phone with a reporter or any opportunity, you should really understand if it's a conference or if it's a media opportunity, things are different, but let's say it's a conference and your executive is going to be on a panel. Mm -hmm. You should always figure out like who else is going to be on the panel. Do we want to sit next to that person? 
Does that person have a viewpoint that's aligned with our values? Is it going to be stale? Is it not going to be stale? Mm -hmm. Can we figure out how to just do a keynote? That would be for a conference. Um, for broadcast, you always want to know who's going on before and who's going on after. Mm -hmm. So like if someone from Robinhood was going on today because the stock price is down to $13 a share and then you have your executive in fintech on after talking about, you know, rainbows and roses and how amazing the product is, it's probably not going to come across that well because yeah. they're going to talk about the Robin Hood and like, oh, fintech is down overall. There's a lot of overvaluation. Mm -hmm. Do you think we're seeing a market correction? Um, and the same goes with media interviews. So reporters will call, oh, I want to get on the phone. Everybody thinks it's a great opportunity it might not be a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. and it I could keep like, going on about crisis forever. Uh, no, well, yeah, yes, <laughs> I think that would be great. I would love to hear you talk a little bit more. I was just going to say um, one thing, which is, you know, it sounds like at a meta level, what you're really saying is it's great to land the opportunity, but then you really want to try to control it and control the right. outcome and make sure it's going to be an amazing outcome. Right. I always say no bad stories, at least not on my watch. I don't want any surprises. I always try to understand exactly how the piece is going to read. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, helps also manage the relationship internally. Yeah. So I can go to the CEO at Acorn. He's never going to be surprised by what's coming out ever. Um, another thing that happens in crisis, and this is like probably one of the funniest things to watch from my perspective, someone will reach out and they'll say like, oh, I have all these allegations here's all my questions, I'm writing this piece. And then the instinct always, every single time is like, oh my God, do they have this story? They're going to write a hit piece, but we didn't even do this. To, like, let's bring the lawyers in. Let's have the lawyers call the reporter. Like, we're going to sue them. It's just, it's all crazy. So mm -hmm. like, instead of getting very emotional, I would say figure out like really tactically does the reporter even have a story? Probably mm -hmm. not. Nine out of 10 times, they don't have a story because you need a valid source. And so what I've seen a lot of sort of like very green uh, peer people do is they'll write back answers to every single question. <laughs> and then basically the you, <laughs> you just became the source. Like you just gave them the story. So if any communications people are listening or any CEOs, I would say, don't do that. Uh, maybe get on the phone and speak on background and go line by line and just, you know, approach it as if you were a lawyer mm -hmm. and factually just say, this isn't accurate. Let me tell you what is accurate. Yeah, it's really interesting. I, I want to talk a little bit about investing in PR and doing that instead of marketing. And obviously this is, you know, playing kind of right into Bevel, <laughs> what you're doing. But <laughs> this is also why I wanted to have you on the show is one thing that I've observed now is a lot of very smart people um, that I really respect. And these are typically VCs or, um, you know, CEOs, senior execs who have been, you know, really vocal about how much they like PR. And so as, and as an example, I was doing some research before this and, you know, Bill Gurley has talked multiple times. So he's a well-known partner at Benchmark. And he said things like, you know, most companies way under invest in PR. They will spend to the moon on variable marketing, meaning maybe this month it's 100,000, maybe next month it's 200,000, but they stop PR at 50K a month, which is crazy to me. You know, and then he, his other point was uh, that he, lo I like this, he loves PR as much as he hates paid marketing <laughs> because I'm sure he feels like PR is, you know, controllable. It's this, it's this great outcome um, and paid marketing and can just be a slog. What's your reaction to that? And, and what do you, you know, what do you say uh, to a founder or a company that maybe just doesn't know why it's smart to invest in PR? Talk about like the investment case, <laughs> why it's so Sure. Important. So we work with 50% of our portfolios, actually, we work with venture capital funds and then the other 50% is brand. So I've heard it on both sides. Uh, there are VCs who are like, you need to over index on PR and over invest. And then there are others who honestly, I just don't think understand it. And they probably had bad experiences because there's a lot of PR firms out there who will literally take on any client. And you just can't do that because one, not 
I mean, let's be honest, not every product is interesting. Not everyone has a story. And PR isn't right for everyone. Um, But I think now what we're seeing is, at least on the growth marketing side, the costs have gotten significantly higher. Yeah, they're crazy in a lot of places. (laughs) Like crazy high. (laughs) And people are spending insane amounts of money. And so the CAC, which is cost uh, per acquisition of a customer, has gone, has skyrocketed, at least on the fintech side of things. And so people are spending a lot of money to acquire a customer. And typically they're doing that through paid ads on TikTok, Instagram, you like Facebook. And then every single tech company, from what I've seen, you know, maybe this is a grandiose statement, but a lot of them are working with the same influencers. Mm-hmm. And so there's customer fatigue. They're seeing the same influencers used across all of these platforms. And then they don't, one, it's an ad. And two, it's just, it's not authentic. And with PR, you can, one, build your own content channels and you can earn trust with your customers and acquire them in a different way. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think a good example is one of the venture capital funds we work with is called Torch Capital. They've invested in Sweetgreen, ZocDoc, Row. I mean, like yeah, they've great. invested in a lot of amazing companies. One of their fintech companies is this uh, neo bank called Lilly. And the founder was actually very against doing PR. And the VC was like, no, 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 you have to work with Bevel. I promise you, like, stop spending money on growth marketing. And so we literally doubled their customer base in nine months um, from 220,000 to 500,000 customers. And we did this really interesting content campaign with Adam Wahid, who is an influencer on Instagram. And we had over 1.5 million views on TikTok and Instagram. So things like that, I think you can start to marry different channels like in the same way without paying them and doing a a paid ad yeah i mean i think your point around which is what everyone wants that you're building this proprietary communication channel is really important and i think people are realizing that you know anytime you're paying one those costs can change i mean the number of uh you know consumer like cpg founders that have just had a terrible 2021 because their cost to acquire customers is literally tripled and is still at yeah. that high level and they're struggling to get it back down is is crazy um i want to talk a little bit about uh, you know, when you recommend that companies start investing in PR. So you talked about that you guys are one of the first, obviously, you, you'll work with companies as early as seed. At the same time, you know, as, as we've talked about a little bit, there are companies that are at the seed stage that don't really have anything that's ready for the world yet. They don't have a product that's compelling or they have an idea, but it's not visualized or they haven't you know, invested in brand. So just what's your take on when when it's right to start investing in PR? What are kind of the check boxes that people need to check to know? OK, yes, <laughs> I'm ready. Sure. So we probably look at over 300 deals or companies a year. And we'll take on 10% of those. So, you know, like 30 companies. Now our portfolio is at about 45. But what we look at, we look at three things. One, are you working on something that we haven't heard of before? Because we see so much that if it sounds the same as something that somebody else is doing, Mm -hmm. it's very likely that it is the same. So are you doing something that the market needs. Um, Two, are you a second or third time founder? Um, And then three, the network effect. And what I mean by that is who is in your network? Who is backing you? Mm -hmm. You know, for the travel company, we had never represented a travel company, but the co-founder Priceline was on their board. And um, they also had Union Square Ventures as, as an investor. And so they just had this lineup of really interesting people around them supporting the brand they had never started a company before and so what that means is like we're literally starting at ground zero when they have no media profile you at least Mm -hmm. need to have like the co-founder of priceline going on cnbc and saying like hey i believe in this company and here's why yeah so if you don't have one of those three things you shouldn't do pr um And then there's also in the beginning, like if you look at a company like Plaid, for example, Plaid didn't do any sort of PR in the beginning. Their whole mission was 
let's sign on every single fintech and let's really mm-hmm. build out the product. And it wasn't until their acquisition fell through that they picked up on the media and PR side. Mm-hmm. And so it can also be very late in a company's life <laughs> when yeah, it really actually I mean, makes sense to start investing. Yep. Right. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Um, let's see here. See if there's anything else. Um, I feel like we've covered a lot of ground. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you're like, we absolutely have to talk about <laughs> before we wrap? I don't think so. I do think we, we covered a lot. Okay. And I'm going to ask one random question, okay. uh, which is, um, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of timely, but I think one, um, it's timely in the sense that I feel like this has been building for a while, but I, you know, I know a number of founders. One of the perspectives I think a lot of founders have today is that the media is out to get us, meaning they don't like tech companies. They don't like, you know, they always want to have the the bear case. They want to try to compare you to Theranos or WeWork or what is your take there? And, and the reason I'm asking is because I always struggle with, is this real versus perceived? <laughs> Like, is this even a thing or is this just a a shared sense? Do you think there's any validity there? I don't know. Any thoughts? So I have a secret to tell you. What is it? Founders (laughs) and CEOs typically like control and they like to be in control. And the one thing you cannot control is the media. And that's what journalism is for. And so what I've found, and it's almost every single founder I've ever worked with, in the beginning, they always have that view. Media is out to get us, you know, because in their their peer group, it's probably similar. And what I say to them is, you know, building a relationship with the press is like anything else. You should approach Mm -hmm. it as if you're building a relationship to make a big sale or with an investor go out to drinks with reporters, open up the book to the extent that you can really share with them what's going on because there is nothing worse than having somebody else tell your own story for you. Hmm. And the reason is, is typically wrong. (laughs) So I think anytime you hear that, it's just their reaction was, oh, they're out to get me. And then they didn't get on the phone. And then the reporter has to fill the paper with somebody's notes. Sure. And so they end up calling everyone else who isn't you. And on the flip side of that, you know, and, and maybe, you know, you don't have any pieces that <laughs> come out like this for your for your clients. But when, so, you know, when you're working with someone and they have that reaction, whether you think it's justified or not, what do you say to them? Is it just, don't worry, this is just one story? Like, what what would be the general kind of line of thinking or what would you say to that person? I try to use a super basic example, like, you know, do you have a friend who cheated on their partner? And if they say yes, and then I'm like, okay, well, would that person, should that person speak to the media or should they let their spouse speak to the media and then they sort of that example for whatever reason i mean it's very relatable and people then seem to understand but i always just i can be fairly convincing and i can always convince someone to get on the phone and i'll usually say listen if you're not going to do the interview i'm going to do it on your behalf And then they'll it's probably they'll a good. It. <laughs> yeah. the, it's the ace in your back, back pocket to make sure that mm-hmm. they show up. Well, this has been this has been incredible. I mean, I I wanted to, you know, cover dive deep into PR, talk about why it's interesting, talk about the different ways to approach it. I feel like we've covered an incredible amount of ground. Where can people, and typically I have all of this in notes. I did not do my homework this time. So I'm just going to ask the question, where can people find Bevel and where can they follow you if you're on Twitter, if you're on social? Sure. So they can go to bevelpr.com. We also have a community called Bevel Books and Bourbon, where We basically have the top thought leaders and different novelists go through their books and we'll meet quarterly. So that can be fun and you can meet some of our clients and also different reporters. And then on social, you know, it's funny, we have our blog, so I'll often write for that. I'm I'm 
big on Instagram stories. I don't post a lot, but if you want to follow my adventures, it's just jfran underscore PR. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the time. This has been incredible, Jessica. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for your time.